My name is uh, my name is Alan Baruby. I'm a, a deputy director at the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings, and I'm really pleased to be with you this morning to moderate a panel that I, I, I think and hope builds directly on the global dynamics and the regional competitiveness factors that Bruce was just alluding to. The title of the panel is uh, Aligning Workforce Strategies to Support Advanced Manufacturing. Um, over the course of the conversation this morning, and I, I think you already heard a little bit of this in Bruce's presentation, uh, you're gonna hear terms uh, in, including but not limited to um, probably skills gap, uh, competitiveness and competition, uh, and the German model. So I just want to I just want to acknowledge that all of this is just getting me really nervous about the game that's coming up uh, <laughs> at noon today. Um, and I know that you all recently got a, an MLS franchise here in Louisville. Congratulations! So you all should be nervous about this too. Uh, and so I'm going to stay on time so everybody has time to go back and put on their face paint before the game. Uh, 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 in all seriousness, I am very uh, honored and gratified to be joined by a, a group of folks that I had the pleasure of spending a round table with yesterday, uh, really inspired by the work uh, going on in this region to tackle the workforce challenges that uh, you and a lot of other metropolitan areas across the country are, are facing today as you think about the future of your economy and especially the future of advanced manufacturing as a driver of your economy. So I'll give very brief introductions here. I think their full bios are in your materials. Uh, from, from my left, starting with uh, Rena Sharp. Uh, Rena is the Vice President of North American Operations for uh, Westport Axel. Uh, she is also uh, on the executive board for BEAM, the Bluegrass Economic Advancement Movement, and she is the chair-elect of the Kentuckiana Works Board as well within here in the Louisville region. Uh, to her left is Dr. Augusta Julian, uh, Dr. Julian is the president and chief executive officer of Bluegrass Community and Technical College. They have seven campuses, I believe, to BCTC and serving about 18,000 students uh, today in central Kentucky. Uh, and finally, to Dr. Julian's uh, left is Mark Tompkins. Mark is the vice president uh, at the German American Chamber of Commerce of the Midwest. And Mark and his colleagues work with businesses uh, across, I believe, 14 states. Uh, stretching from Ohio to Colorado and including the, the great state of Kentucky too. So thank you all for, for being here with us this morning. We're going to do about 30 minutes of, of moderated dialogue and then leave about 10 minutes for, for questions at the end. Um, so I'd just like to start off uh, with a question to, to any of you uh, regarding any sort of top line reactions you had to the kind of dynamics that Bruce was just talking about, especially how we're thinking about and describing the link between regional skills here and global competitiveness and access to global markets. The analogy Bruce used of the sort of the, the underutilized limb and whether you think that really holds in, in this region and sort of other regions that, that you're working in too, Mark. Any, any reactions off the top? Well, I'll go ahead and start off a little bit and say Kentucky is a state that makes things. And so that plays in very well to what Bruce was outlining. And that comparison back to Germany too. Germany mm -hmm. is a country that never forgot how to make things and not get in that race to the bottom in terms of wages uh, and downgrading skills. So I in that case, there is an opportunity going forward. And I think that's one of the things that's neat to see all everything that is going on here and where that opportunity is going forward. everything. So all of the businesses that we are working with, the industries, manufacturing as well as others, are all international companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've heard it said, and I know it's true, that you know it's not Louisville and Lexington that are competing anymore for business development. Um, it's, you know, we're competing with all of those places that Bruce talked about. Mm -hmm. And so the issue of a quality workforce becomes even more critical as we think about um, the, the globalization of um, workforce development as well as everything else. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, actually being um, a Brazilian-owned company, and I've actually been there for 28 years, uh, most of the manufacturing, especially the more advanced manufacturing, was always done in Brazil because we really could not be competitive here. We acted for years more of a distribution arm. Uh, we did some basic light assembly work for them. Uh, until about three or four years ago, and we actually started to, to look at the numbers and we, we could be competitive here. But we got super excited about it, and to Bruce's point, we were totally unprepared. 
Um, and we, we literally could not do the work as well with the quality level that was required. Uh, we're still getting there, you know, because the, the workforce that came in, uh, because the manufacturing, you know, of today is totally different, you know, than it was uh, in the past. Uh, and so coming from being excited because we were able to gain business, you know, here in the United States from our parent in Brazil and not being fully capable of doing the job that we, we obviously want to do, um, you know, I agree with pretty much what he was saying. I mean, it's, it's we've got to get there. And that's where the workforce part of it is the, the passionate part for me. That's great. So, Rena, maybe you could pick up on that and talk a little bit about what uh, manufacturers here in the Louisville region have been up to recently around the new manufacturing career center you all launched. Uh, how that's been going, and then where that's leading you to in terms of a, a new blueprint initiative that we discussed yesterday. Uh, how that, uh, what are the elements of that, and where are, you, where are you hoping that takes the workforce discussion in this region? With two minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> two to um, three, if you like. Yeah. Actually, I was very honored to be a part of included in the BEAM initiative um, uh, by the mayors, and I actually think I was put on that um, board because of complaining about not having workers. And what I realized pretty quickly is that I was very uneducated, you know, 28 years and I still didn't know a whole lot, um, is that we were a part of the problem. You know, manufacturing companies, I think we're sitting back, we, we still are in many ways and we're getting there, but I think we were sitting back and waiting for people to deliver us, whether it be the city, the schools, you know, just deliver us people who know what to do, how to operate machines and who can do basic blueprint reading and those kind of things. And so being a part of BEAM was kind of the kickoff and the start, I think, for manufacturing companies. You know, they brought a group of us together. We collaborated on, on that initiative. Through that, I became involved in Kentucky Anna Works. Um, through that, we actually opened the first uh, manufacturing career center. And there's a reason it's called career and not jobs mm -hmm. or, you know, unemployment center. Um, and that career center actually through Kentucky and it works in the mayor's office, Cindy Reed, Michael Gritton, I don't know if either of them are here, but you know, it's amazing because we actually started a manufacturing advisory committee. They asked me to chair that committee and it was a group of Brown Foreman, GE, uh, Ford, um, Inchworks, I think that's here today, Universal Woods, a lot of companies, about 25 of us sat with them and they said, what do you want us to teach here? You know, what do you want the people who come in the door to know? And so we helped them to build the curriculum. Uh, we're still working on that, it's evolving obviously. Um, and I do wanna say, I didn't mention this yesterday in the round table, but we actually have had almost 200 people placed since last May when the center opened into jobs. Um, and our companies are actually putting out on our, um, on our website, if you go here and you get this, then you're gonna be very favorable to have a job. Mm -hmm. So that was the start of the manufacturing company stepping up and taking responsibility. And to lead into that, through that group, um, Randy Reed actually is, is on that committee. He basically started with you know, General Electric, um, very pleased to be included in that. And many of the companies on the Manufacturing Career Center Advisory Group are part of this new initiative. And it's basically, you know, we have a three-step goal um, Toyota started something a few years ago down in, in Lexington, mm -hmm. and uh, it's kind of grown into something that they call FAME, and it's an Earn to Learn program. Um, Augusta is the expert on that, so I won't go into a lot of detail, that. but yeah. we, we, the GE collected a bunch of us together, and we started talking about what we needed to do, and we said, hey, they've already done it. It's working really well mm -hmm. down you know, in Lexington, and so we're going to duplicate the FAME model. Mm -hmm. That's our, our first goal. The second is to get very intimately involved in the education system and with the administrators in the high schools, middle schools, um, helping to see what we can do to, to get the parents to understand that there's things that their kids can do. Mm -hmm. Of course, four-year degree is, is you know great, but uh, as Bruce said, sometimes there's guys who are very bright, girls who are very bright that we can get them into school by getting them into our companies. Yeah. You know, and the relationship somebody mentioned yesterday you know, the, um, the first relationship needs to, to be between us and the employee. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's in middle school, if that's in high school, then we as companies realize now that we need to step up and we need to go there, we need to get involved uh, to make that happen. And then third but not uh, last, uh, recreate, uh, rebrand, I think is what we call it on the BEAM board, kind of goes back to that, is rebrand manufacturing, working with Kentucky um, Association of Manufacturing as well as the National NAM and CAM. Um, that's kind of the third part to that. Mm -hmm. Is that two minutes? That was great. Uh, <laughs> and it picks up on something that Greg Higdon from the Kentucky Association of Manufacturers said yesterday, I believe their motto now is, there are no more jobs in manufacturing, right. only careers in manufacturing. So Augusta, True. I wonder, you know, having been a key partner in the FAME initiative that uh, folks are hoping to bring here to the Louisville region, talk a little bit about 
your experience with that, what sort of results you're seeing, and sort of what a potential, the way you work with employers in the future. Well, the um, origin uh, of this effort was when Toyota came to our college and our system and said, um, we have a huge number of uh, manufacturing technicians, our top specialized um, maintenance workers are going to be retiring. And uh, you know they've learned our system and our way for 25 years, and we're really concerned about then uh, you know what happens next and how we continue to grow as a company and keep our manufacturing uh, at a high quality. And so the con those conversations began, and that's really the way it always ought to happen: that a manufacturer or an industry or a business comes and says, "I have a workforce need, mm -hmm. and I want to talk to my local community and technical college about uh, how to deal with that." So um, those conversations went on, uh, the internship model, kind of what we began to call it, where, um, or work and learn, or earn and learn, where the students were integrated and are integrated with um, Toyota in the beginning, um, from the very uh, point that they begin their academic career at our two-year institution. So um, they work uh, three days a week, they go to school two days a week, uh, I've seen other models where maybe there's a longer period of time where it's um, eight week um, uh, involvement in an academic program, learning theory, learning skills, practicing those, and then a placement in a workforce uh, situation where they then get to actually experience mm -hmm. the um, manufacturing floor or whatever that industry is and apply those skills. So um, there's a variety of ways that this can happen, but uh, the model that was created that has turned into SAME, the Federation of Advanced Manufacturing Education, uh, was that extremely integrated model day to day. Uh, so the students um, are able then to go on the uh, manufacturing floor uh, and apply what they talked about in class yesterday. Uh, and the key, uh, and Rena just said it, is um, you know that that there really is uh, absolute integration from the very beginning. Our students are expected, uh, like any Toyota or other industry employer, in, um, to um, meet the, their obligations as an employee. Uh, we take those very seriously uh, in terms of the academic program. And um, so once that became kind of a successful model, uh, Toyota really stepped up and said, this has to be bigger than mm -hmm. Toyota and BCT. Mm -hmm. So they moved on and began to invite suppliers and other major uh, industry partners in the area to step up and yep. sponsor students. These students do get um, uh, wages while they're working. Uh, they get other kind of support from that business or industry. And so it really begins to uh, mold the student from a very early uh, time in their career. The other part of it quickly is that um, they, uh, the um, industries involved in same, they actually go into the high schools or into the middle schools or now even into the primary schools and talk about rebranding, manufacturing education, what it can mean. They're involved in STEM education. Mm -hmm. They're involved in uh, activities like Project Lead the Way, focus on engineering. Uh, and then they really help to track and follow those students and encourage them throughout that pathway and then beyond uh, to a bachelor's degree. So it really is the whole uh, pathway or, or um, uh, career opportunity from start to finish of what um, manufacturing, in this case, um, career might look like. So Mark, so reflecting on what uh, the models that we're describing here and then thinking back to the statistics that Bruce had in his presentation about the much larger role that advanced manufacturing plays in the German economy versus the U.S. economy today, it's sort of a share of its GDP or a position in the export mm -hmm. economy. Tell us why the German American Chamber of Commerce is on this panel and tell when we talk <laughs> about the German model, what are we really talking about and are the kinds of things we're mm -hmm. describing here getting us closer to what that is? Well, in the German model, it's been thrown around a lot. Uh, it really is based going back all the way to the guild system in, in Germany and then it's been refined and updated and modernized on an ongoing basis. So the chambers play a role there in that mm -hmm. every manufacturing company is a member of the chamber, so there's no free rider syndrome. By Everybody's law, right? by law yeah. is mm -hmm. in there. So there are certain advantages there um, in just the nature and structure and history. Um, that doesn't mean it, it won't work here. So um, 
we're working on bringing the model here throughout the US, and my colleagues around the country are working on it too, and we're a bilateral chamber. About out of our 2,500 members nationally, about half of them are German subsidiaries that are here in the US, and about half of them are US companies. So back to the game that you mentioned, our official position is we're rooting for a tie today. <laughs> um, so that way both go through and everything's good. Then you and I can keep talking. And then we're great. all yeah. good. Um, but really what it is at the core is a public-private partnership. So you have the dual model where the companies have the students working directly with them. You have the educational institutions working right alongside. And it's a curriculum that's led by industry and what that turns into then, and the way you just described, it's a great way to learn. Mm -hmm. You have immediate application of what you've learned theoretically mm -hmm. than in a practical environment. So if you boil it down, there's really three key trademarks that go into a dual system, and that's what we're seeing happen here in Kentucky and a few places around the country as well. Number one is it's first that company trainee relationship. Mm -hmm. Traditionally in the US, we've have a, had a very relationship where it's the school and the student. And then someday the company will get in the picture. In Germany, straight out of high school, the student relationship is with the company on that training program augmented by the theoretical. And that's a pathway that you can get on and get off at any point all the way up through advanced degrees. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very flexible in doing that and then the companies support it because they're looking for a world-class workforce. And you're not going to make world-class products and be able to export around the world, what Bruce said, unless you have a wor world-class workforce. Mm -hmm. And that brings in the second point tied into very high standards. And traditionally in the US, we've taken a very let's say local and state approach to what do we need to train and we're going to train it to a standard that's here local or a standard that's based on a state standard and companies work globally you know I have members all the time CEOs who come I don't know what this standard is here it doesn't apply to my plant mm -hmm. elsewhere in the US or my plant in Japan or my plant in China or my plant in Germany looking at global standards and how do you align those so that does enable when you have the engineering our R&D supervisor come from Germany to the US, he knows what that plant floor staff can do because he knows at what standard they're trained mm -hmm. at. So that's the second one is having high level standards, high level skills, because then you have world class people that can make world class products. Um, and it's more than just filling butts and seats and making sure you have somebody standing on a line. Yeah. The third point of that is then also making sure, and it's exactly what's happened here, you have a consortium approach. Mm -hmm. The US tends to be, and we're really good at it, creating a one-off. And how do you get models? The big companies also, no problem, they have their training programs. But I think it's a real sign of leadership where you have big companies saying, we're gonna expand this out to our ecosystem around us. And now, not just in Lexington, and that those models expand to include Louisville, that's something that's really a position of leadership. And that's what the German model is based on everybody's training yeah. and granted you have about a quarter of the manufacturing companies in Germany offering apprenticeships mm -hmm. for that very reason is it's good for them then down the road if they need to find workers they know to what uh, standard they've been trained to because their entire ecosystem is built on that philosophy so uh, taking taking what um, Mark is talking about in terms of the German model and the elements of a successful program into consideration this is Rena or Augusta I wonder if you could talk about how, you know, how you're thinking about the imperative to stimulate demand on both sides of the equation, right? Demand among employers for reaching down the pipeline to get at younger kids, to get them into the system, to make the commitment to these sorts of earn and learn programs that are showing success, you know, as kind of one-offs, but certainly as a, as a systematic thing in Germany and Central Europe. Um, but then the kids, too. What, what is it really gonna take to, re to reach the kids, not just one by one on a kind of bilateral educational institution or to child or employer to child uh, relationship, but uh, reaching a lot of kids at once and stimulating their desire to get into a career like advanced manufacturing. What is it gonna take to really ramp up demand on both sides of the equation, do you think? Um, I'll speak to the, the kids part of it and then you can talk more about the education because it's kind of a two point. You know, I think that, um, you know, I th 
since I've been on this journey, um, I've actually thought about like when I was growing up, you know, mm -hmm. what, what was different. I grew up in, in Kentucky about three hours from here. Um, pretty rural area, a few manufacturing companies, but not many. But you know, I think back in the day, you know, people fix their cars, people change their oil, you know, I mean, just looking at it in that approach of what's different with the kids today. I have a 16 year old son. Uh, sometimes it's challenging to get him to walk to the mailbox and take the garbage can and bring it back. <laughs> um, but on his phone, we've talked about, you know, Bruce was mentioning the phone. You know, I think that um, technology is great, but I think that technology has really cut out with our young people a lot of problem solving from Legos, you know, everybody used to be really big into the Legos, um, you know, and, and critical thinking. You know, everything you can just push a button and ask, um, you know, Siri, you know, hey, what's this? And mm -hmm. she tells you, and you don't have to really try to figure out how, how she got that information. So I think that we have to really get, you know, the robotic systems. All the schools now are getting into robotics competitions. And that's the kind of stuff that we have to really foster from an early age in elementary school. Mm -hmm. So I think that getting the awareness, those are the kind of things, identifying those kids and then educating the parents. Because my daughter's getting ready to go to Purdue this fall, leaving me. I didn't ask her to go into a manufacturing job. Mm -hmm. You know, she kind of always wanted to be an attorney and it kind of mm -hmm. went that route. And my son, I guess he probably will work for me at Westport if he doesn't play basketball in college, because that's all, you know, he wants to do. But you know, kids are so different. And tapping into that um, element early on so that they feel confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, what we see on, especially the young people that come into Westport, it's not that they're bad at all. They're not bad employees. They just get so intimidated right. by the work. You know, they, they see a blueprint and they've never seen a blueprint before, mm -hmm. you know, and they, they have a gauge that they've got to use every day and they've never used a gauge before. And so I think tapping into the awareness, um, by getting the parents buy in. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually send kids to school, by the way, Westport, we have a program called our STAR program and we want kids, I do believe, as Augusta said yesterday, I don't say people don't need an education. But you know, some of those kids, you know, they come to us and then we send them, once we identify them, we send them to, to further, uh, you know, their education. So sometimes it's just the awareness and I think the rebranding of manufacturing, letting people know that, hey, you can make sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year without a college degree at our company within just a few years. Mm -hmm. It's not 20 years right. that you have to, to get that. So um, I think that's key yeah. on the, that part of it. And I, and I have to think, and maybe Augusta, you have some thoughts on this, that the, the increasing amount of technology that's actually part and parcel of advanced manufacturing can mean that you know, kids' interest and attraction to technology doesn't necessarily need to be in opposition with thinking about advanced manufacturing as a career, but actually maybe an on-ramp to a career in advanced manufacturing. I do think that that is true, and I have seen a huge change in how uh, technology is used and is um, encouraged, mm -hmm. and the bridges are made from the social media, you know, smartphone that <laughs> I guess 11-year-olds and maybe younger have them now, <laughs> but um, to, to a career. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think that the schools and, and um, organizations like Project Lead the Way and others are really helping parents, and I think that is a key, and uh, young students to understand that there are many ways that technology is used in um, various career fields and to think more broadly about um, if that's an interest, and it is apparently for all of them now, uh, that, that those are many, there are many ways that that can be applied and many careers that they can go into. Um, and I think that uh, I am seeing um, the same project being won, but um, many ways that, it, that employers are understanding more and more mm -hmm. the necessity of being involved in education at earlier and earlier uh, ages. Um, one issue that we face in Kentucky is the issue of how to um, deal with um, dual credit or high school cre college credits at the high school level. Um, so as a policy issue, I will just say that is something that needs attention. I think I saw Tom Shelton, the superintendent of the Fayette uh, County Schools here earlier. And um, uh, we have a wonderful relationship, but that is not true across the state. Right. So I think this issue of how to um, encourage young people to think about getting career and technical credits, getting skills, um, is one that we need to address um, as a commonwealth. Yeah. Um, are, Mark, I wonder, did, are these uh, perception problems, I guess, on mm -hmm. the student or parent side or you know, even on the employer side, um, 
Did those have any resonance in Germany at all? I mean, again, you've had the, the Germany has the benefit of doing this for 500 years <laughs> in a very sure. strong national system. And mm -hmm. are there any lessons from you know, the specifics of how they do it that can help overcome some of these perception challenges? You well, I think on a couple levels. One, you know, Germany is having to rethink a little bit. They got on a little track of saying, oh, geez, everybody has to go to college. Uh -huh. The one advantage is a lot of parents have still said, you know, go learn something practical first, mm -hmm, right. and then go on and get your degree. Right, right. And so there's a little bit of that tradition that even if you are going on to be an engineer, first you're gonna have some experience mm -hmm. in a manufacturing environment, which then adds value to that engineering degree that comes after it. But I think the other key thing, and it ties back into the high schools, uh, is eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, it's mandatory across states in Germany to go out and do an internship. Now that doesn't have to be a manufacturing internship, mm -hmm. that could be in finance or wherever sure. else you want to go, but it's one week, two week, three weeks to get at least some hands on and say, do I like this? Before you go down a path that maybe you find out, geez, I didn't really like that. I don't like being you know, in an office all day with the lights sitting at a desk mm -hmm. in a finance world. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I wanna be on a manufacturing floor and working with my hands. And that's what those internships give kids at a really early age an opportunity to find out maybe where they do have ideas. So as a parent uh, of my daughters in Project Lead the Way uh, up in Illinois, and, and it's a great program, I think we need to make sure we have that tie then back to industry. And guess who's the first one to line up and say, hey, come into our plant and do an internship? It's the manufacturer. Right, right. Because that is building that pipeline. And then you uh, alleviate some of the issues of the first time somebody's stepping foot on a plant floor is their first day of work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's one thing that we've seen that can really make a difference. Which is great. Uh, can I just say yeah, one, quick, absolutely. one yeah. quick thing, and that is that I think in education we have to stop talking about sort of two pathways. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, there's a career and technical pathway and then there's a transfer bachelor's pathway. And what we need parents particularly to understand is that there are multiple ways of getting to bachelor's degrees. And for some students, the technical skills pathway is the better choice. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't mean that you know, we, we've stuck you somewhere and that's only you know, the, the opportunity that you're gonna have um, if you see that as kind of a less than, and we know it's not, but some parents still see it that way. So I just wanted to say that we need to think differently and talk differently even in education mm -hmm. about how um, students and graduates can get to one step, right. the next step, the next step. Right. And I'll bring it back out to the point I mentioned before about having consortia. Mm -hmm. If you have a group of companies, it's a lot easier to get those companies engaged with students when they're going in and selling a program like Kentucky Fame. Yep. And, and we've seen that around the country, that if you're going in with a program, then it's much easier than one company that most kids have never heard of before, mm -hmm. you know, outside of maybe GE or the big guys. Right. Um, they may have heard of them, but they don't really know what that is. So if you're going in with a consortium in a program, and particularly in a program where you can go through, come out with an associate's degree, no debt, and a job, and get paid while you do it, suddenly a lot of those issues of, oh, don't go to manufacturing, fall away with yeah. the guidance counselors, with the moms, oh, that's a great deal. You know, no debt, and you're coming out of this with a job, <laughs> love it. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I think we have a few minutes to uh, take some questions and, and comments or reflections from the audience. I gather we have a couple people around here with mics. There's, there's my colleague Amelia uh, and there's my colleague Karen. So if you just raise your hand, they'll, they'll walk over, uh, hand you the mic, and if you could just identify yourself um, and ask a question, that'd be great. We have a few minutes for this now. Hey, there we Julian, go. Hey, there you go. I guess uh, I appreciate what you said a moment ago. I think. Uh, one of the things that all of us in this room need to do is help the counselors in high school change their mindset. I think some of them think they're too busy doing stuff they shouldn't be busy doing and be more engaged in what is the future potential for each child in that school and how do they get there. Um, I've been involved with the Institute for Aerospace Education as a board member and uh, we've got high school kids that are studying college work towards STEM, towards advanced manufacturing, towards aerospace, towards aviation. And uh, those kids are ready to go when they graduate from high school. Uh, but we do still have some problems with collaborations and uh, we need to 
be able to expand those collaborations so those kids can do exactly what he said. They can get an associate's degree, they can get a certificate of um, career uh, knowledge and, and something. And then if they want to advance their education, once they get into the job workforce and see where their potential is, uh, then they can take that degree and go get uh, advanced education. Yeah, if you have any reactions to sort of how to effectively reach the, the folks on the ground who are talking to students day in and day out about careers. I'll say two things. One, um, I have incredible um, um, uh, just belief that guidance counselors are doing the best that they can. Uh, I do believe that, again, we may need a shift in how in education we think about career possibilities and how guidance counselors and teachers and other people talk to students about those opportunities. Um, I think in some ways our public schools are meeting so many challenges that are just incredibly complicated with a lot of social issues. But um, I think, again, as, as we work together, public schools, um, community and technical colleges, universities, employers, that that's the way we're gonna get the message out there. And um, secondly, I think that's a great example, getting students interested in aeronautics, for example, so that you know they see how to apply technical skills, they see where the technology can lead them, mm -hmm. and um, so that's a way to engage students that really kind of sets a path or, or at least opens up opportunities that they might not have known before. And to that point, uh, as far as we talked about earlier, manufacturing companies getting involved in the school systems to help them. Um, I mentioned yesterday in the round table, I interviewed some administrators and one principal in particular in the surrounding county here in Jefferson, um, they're building a, a really nice career center. And so I asked him, what kind of things are you gonna have in this career center? And um, it was more uh, clerical, administrative. There was not one thing involving manufacturing that they had planned. And so when I asked him what about manufacturing and told him about the wages, you know, I was prepared with all my data about what, what we pay. And uh, he kind of looked at me like I had three heads, but he was very interested. You know, to, he really just, they just had not planned for that. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, what can you do to help us do that? You know, and so that's where we're learning all the time about we need to be there. We need to be talking to these folks. We need to be making them understand some of the statistics some of the data and helping them to build a section in their career centers mm -hmm. that is focused around what we need. A question over this side. Good morning, um, Dr. Gilliam, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Dr. Gilliam this morning for her leadership in the Consortium for Higher Education. And I thought, given what we're talking about this morning, if you would give a couple comments and I'd like your colleagues to also uh, give some thoughts around that because it's certainly a model that we can move forward on. Uh, yes, we have a consortium and I think uh, there actually is one that is even um, has longer history here in the Louisville area of higher education institutions working together. Um, again, two year, four year research universities, private, um, in trying to address some of these issues and we're working on um, mostly career and college readiness, mm -hmm. and then trying to um, create uh, academic leadership for our institutions. Um, but certainly the, the readiness, the connection to employers, uh, this expanding the um, way of thinking of families and, and students is a big part of that. So it's a, it's a, any kind of consortium like that I think can make a difference and add to the conversation. I think we have time for one last question if anybody else. Um, the one right here. Hi, my name is Karen Vaughn, and I am the recipient uh, that was mentioned earlier for the Bean Grant, and I thank you very much. Uh, we are in rural Kentucky, even though we're just a uh, little less than an hour southwest of here if you float down the river. But I also want to mention that in rural Kentucky, like other rural states, Manufacturing jobs sometimes need to start out at that minimum wage level. We work with a group that takes welfare moms, uh, single moms from welfare to work. Um, and they're not the only ones that come and knock on our door that want those jobs that start at 725, that we have to train them. And it's not just train them in, um, well, we have CAD and CAB and CNC jobs that pay more but a lot of our workers sew. 
they cut material and they sew. And we start them out at 725, they're on probation. Sometimes before their probation is over, they can get an increase. But we have people that don't make it because we have to teach them work ethic. You have to show up at eight o'clock in the morning. No, you can't text and be on your cell phone all day. You have to work. And um, you know, I tell people on interviews, you add value to our company, we can pay you more. But that doesn't always happen. So in rural Kentucky, those minimum wage jobs are very important. We have to be able to bring people in at a wage that we can afford to train them because we put a lot of time and effort into them. And we compete against jobs, sewing jobs in Mexico, Costa Rica, uh, China. So in order for us to compete and stay strong and export back to those countries also, those jobs are needed. Mm -hmm. And then we're more than happy as we make more money because of our workforce, then mm -hmm. we can bring them forward. Mm -hmm. So please help us in that respect. Thank you. So Rena, I think uh, it, there's probably an analogy here in terms of how you all have been working on the Manufacturing Career Center versus thinking about the blueprint that not everybody's starting out at a $70,000 a year job. Some are coming right. in and working on this broader range of work skills to which I think the, the questioner was alluding to. Yes, and we actually, um, you know, depending on if they've ever had any experience at all, it's kind of where we start with our wages. But we do have uh, light pack distribution jobs that are 10 to $12 an hour, closer probably to 12 because most people have had a little bit of experience there. But I do understand, I'm from rural Kentucky, I grew up in Casey County, um, and I understand um, how difficult it is to compete um, at what you have there. Uh, we think that we have difficulties with having, you know, they don't have career training centers in Casey County, I'm quite sure, and probably not in your, in your city uh, either. And so that is a whole nother element, um, you know, that has to be addressed. Um, and I do want to thank, um, I know we're almost finished, but I want to uh, really thank J.P. Morgan Chase for their uh, forward thinking, you know, from the manufacturing perspective and representing the manufacturing company. I really do want to thank them for the money that they are putting in to this effort because it's, uh, you know, I know that that's not, um, the workforce is not, was not always the popular place that's to right. put those dollars, but it really is making a difference. Um, here and hopefully even more out into the counties, we can start to help with, with some of that. So, no, I think y'all are making it popular here uh, yourselves. So that's a, that's the credit to the work that you guys are doing. And I'll, I'll just close with a personal look at anecdote that I think goes to a lot of the themes we're talking about on the panel. Is that uh, you know I went to high school, I was good at math and chemistry, and people said we well, should be a chemical engineer. I was like, okay, I'll be a chemical engineer. I went to college, I spent three years studying chemical engineering. And I finally went to interview for jobs, uh, one including a GE nuclear energy in San Jose, California. And I got there, I said, oh my God, this is what chemical engineers do? <laughs> I, I don't want to do this. Uh, so here I am as a policy hack working at the Brookings Institution <laughs> 20, 20 years later. If I had had exposure to some of the, the models, the practices you all are talking about, uh, I might be on a different path, better or worse, but definitely a, a different one. So uh, I give you all a ton of credit for what you're doing here, the leadership that you're showing. And, as I said yesterday, as Brookings, I think we're just, we're pleased and, and, and gratified to be associated with this region and the work that it's doing and sharing that with our partners across the country too. So I hope you all will join me in thanking our panelists this morning.